that song we just sang is what the angels sing before the throne of God, day and night. Probably different angels at different times there. Nevertheless, as I listen to or as I choose and play these songs, I think about hoping that you all understand the ramifications of some of these words that are used in song. The repetition of a song. If a song has a ton of words, you have to really know the song by heart in order to finally be able to sing it in a way that that communes with God and connects to God. The simpler the song sometimes it's easier to get connected to God and worship because the words are simple and they're they're repeated. And I think about the angels of heaven certainly aren't given list of songs, words of their songs. I think what we see in scripture is that we are seeing a an involuntary expression of a much greater thing that's going on than the mere words convey. Does that make sense? I think when people see God for the first time in his limited glory, and by the way, the Bible says no one has ever seen God at any time. And I believe that to mean not even the angels have seen God in his undiminished glory. And I think that's the only thing that explains why there could be a devil who's actually seen the throne of God and then thought he could become God. It's got to be that he's never also seen God himself in undiminished glory. And so when we see that God limits his glory yet reveals it to people in the Bible, they fall down and pass out is, is the common thing that happens and they are amazed after they see God, there must be a death-like experience that they feel. Of course, passing out is kind of a death-like experience. But when they see God, they, they say some very strange things and they do some very strange things. People that are very good morally, people that were of the highest moral character, like the prophet Isaiah, he saw God, and the first thing he thought of is how unholy and how unclean his lips were, how words would even damage the atmosphere to speak them before God. And this excites me because like everything else I'm going to teach tonight, these things are not negative if you're on the inside track with God. If you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, and he's, Jesus is living in you, and God in his fullness is a part of your life, when you hear of the things of God and the sort of the, our response to the things of God, they are, even though they are counter to us, they're contrary to our nature, yet we've passed beyond the veil of what that means. We know we are not of God's kind when it comes to perfection and holiness. We know that. We understand we're never going to be in this body and be able to transcend and feel comfortable with God's standard. That, that's something that's very important to understand. Otherwise, we'd, get, we'd either give up because we know we could never get there or we would be frustrated because we'd keep trying to get there and, and, and never succeed. But there's this other place to be, and that other place to be is, is to know that there's this infinite opening of opportunity in a real relationship with God like we value our real relationships with one another. I, I value my relationship with all of you. I, I value my relationship with my family, with my wife. It, it makes me feel so good to know that my family thinks enough of me to actually attend my church. That's mind-boggling to me because they've seen me 24 hours a day through my whole life that they would do that, that they would think that that's legit. That's an important thing to me. I want to translate that 
with how I feel about having that relationship with God. And, and I think I do. And so when I come to worship him, it's really about not the song or the words necessarily, although the words hopefully are always scriptural and always following that. But it's more than that. It is actually making a connection to commune with God. And in the Bible, of course, Jesus taught private worship and private prayer. Actually, more private prayer than private worship because God did not set up Israel to go have a bunch of private worship. He, he actually wanted them to come together as a congregation to do their worship. That's why there was a place to offer the sacrifices. There was a priest to offer them. You, you didn't just do your own thing at home and watch YouTube videos. There was a community thing that was important, and that's why the congregation gathered, and they would work together to sing praises to the Lord, to play instruments, to worship the Lord, and, and to understand there's a big difference between what we do together than what we do separately. And we don't want to get ourselves to a place to where we like, you know, isolation, but we don't like corporate worship and those kind of things. This, this shows that we have a, a mistaken notion in our mind because God did not come to save the individual without making them a part of the whole, the church, the body of Christ. It's, it's a completion of the whole system that you can't have unless you have that. And so I thought about this song, and I've got a few of the words that we just sang, and I want to explain them. But before I do, I was thinking of the previous song, or no, in the same song, where the word hallelujah is used over and over again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What is that? By the way, that's a heavenly word <laughs> that the angels also sing. And it means, uh, if you break it down, hallelujah is praise to, and then yah is the root word for God. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. It's the way to say it in Hebrew. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, it's the only untranslated word in the world that I know of. And that is in any language, hallelujah is hallelujah. That's how you say it. So you're talking about a universally accepted word of praise to God that God recognizes as something that uh, it meets his approval. And he would, uh, you know, he would recommend us adopting. And so when we go through these songs, it's amazing. Now, I was thinking of Kenny Rogers. My wife and I like Kenny Rogers songs. They're real romantic. They're t a lot of them are about love. And one day we were talking as the, he sang one of our favorite songs. I, I can't think of the name of it, but it's all about how much he loves her. And we were saying, man, he could sure write a great love song, but he's really having trouble in his life living that thing out because he has been divorced about five times, I think, when I, <laughs> when I heard that song. And I thought, man, he's expressing how I feel about my wife, yet who knows who he's thinking of when he sings that song because they're probably long gone and that love ran out. And I was looking at the words to this last song called Crowns Down by uh, Josh Baldwin. And I wanted to just point out two of the phrases. One of them was, and I will give my life as an offering. You are worthy. I want you to think about that. That's easier said than done. I will give my life as an offering. That's what he's asking you to do. You know those difficult things where the word says to do something and you're not doing it? That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's what he's asking you to do is to go do that thing which he's asking you to do as an offering to the Lord. The Bible says that's your sacrifice. You don't go get a lamb and kill it and put it on an altar, but you go get that thing that you just don't want to obey that the scripture says to do. Offer that. In other words, take your obedience and offer that to the Lord because... He's worthy of any requirement that he asks of us. And the next phrase says, Here at your altar to seek your face, broken and poured out without restraint. It takes some beatings in life to get to that place to where you are actually willing to be broken. And then it says, 
in full abandon before my king. Here I surrender my everything. Wow. That, along with what Tony started it out with tonight, where he said one phrase that just, I wanted to just say, Tony, you, you have no idea how true that is. It says, we're going to face hardships forever. He said, we're going to face hardships. They're not going to go away. That is exactly true because the design of life and the hardships are to corral us and to push us into the right direction. And so now that I've used a whole fourth of my time in my introduction, <laughs> let's get started. Tonight, we are on a part two of authority and subjugation, dealing with temptation, but right now we're not talking about temptations that are lurid and that are sensual, but we're talking about the temptation to live our life apart from the will of God by seeking ways around the difficult things. And I want to talk to you about that tonight. And I want to basically at the beginning give you a roadmap. We're not necessarily going to get through all this tonight, but here's where I want to take us. I wanted to give you a little synopsis of, of where we're going to go. Exploring the design of authority is really essential for rule in the world and for ruling ourselves. Now, I know we just spent, you know, two weeks or one week on authority, and we could easily just say, okay, we covered that, let's go on. But I won't ask you to raise your hand, but everyone knows that if they had to be honest, dealing with authority is not something we can do with one message and get it fixed. It is not going to go away just because we know the right thing to do. So expanding our understanding around authority and how it works is necessary and if not uh, needed to be somewhat repetitious until we can fully grasp the greatness of what this means to our life. Because here's the truth, and, and I am the beneficiary of this, and now I'm trying to be a part with you as to continue this benefit, and that is all of us who, who have lives to live for Christ are blessed to have a place where we count it worthy to take the couple of hours or so or the afternoon in our life to come together and to be reminded of these things that God wants us to be living by. And as a matter of fact, if we do these things, everyone in our life will benefit. Everyone, even our enemies, <laughs> will benefit if we are reminded enough to do them to the point to where we actually start to do them. And I've been around long enough to know in my own self that God has to put things on the front of my mind for a long time before it even makes a dent in my actual actions and what I do. I, I often know what to do, but I am reluctant to jump in and do it. It's like, you know, it's, it's like when they first showed me at a, at a gym one time, hey, jump into this 32 degree water and uh, this is going to make you feel alive. <laughs> and so I tried it and I couldn't get out of that water fast <laughs> enough to go from my 90 degrees to whatever, 32 or whatever it was. It was crazy cold. And it's like I, could, I was in slow motion trying to dig myself out of that water after plunging in. It's crazy. And, and, and that's what life is a, light, a lot like sometimes when we are shown what to do, but when we do it, it's painful. And the power of God to change our life is greatly enhanced at the point to where it is just completely difficult to do it. That's when things really change. So we're going to explore authority at a deeper level. We uh, want to show that authority has its beginning and its connection to God, and you never can disconnect authority from God. He's the source of authority. I also want to demonstrate that subjugation, which means someone is under someone else by design, not by force. Uh, but even if it's by force, it is still a design in the world that has to be. 
The world will not work properly unless these fundamentals are a part of it. And being a child of God, the goal of what I'm teaching you is to get you on God's side about these issues and to receive them as gifts rather than, dang, I don't like this. I don't want this. I don't want to cooperate with this. That's the place where we can make the big change when we get ourselves to that place. And so then what, so what we want to do is demonstrate how subjugation and that wonderful word submission, what is it and what is it going to be like when we understand that the whole world will never, ever be a place where you can be without it, neither can you be without it in the world to come. That's why God has this great separation called Judgment Day because everyone who don't like authority is going to be eliminated, not passing into the next world because those who don't like authority will just cause too many problems in the future and God has to get only those who have embraced it with a bear hug and say, I see it now. I see the light. I'm, I, I see I can't. I personally can't thrive as a spiritual person who believes in Jesus Christ unless I give a bear hug to the whole idea of all authority, everything that authority is. And so we also are going to show examples of Jesus and Paul when they submitted to authority who was against them and wanted to kill them. And yet they did exactly what God would have them to do. And that is to submit. And we're going to look at those scriptures. And we're going to go over the quintessential. I like that word. It's a big one. But the peak, the most fantastic story in the Bible showing God's view and reaction to rebellion. How does he feel about rebellion? How does he feel about Satan's rebellion? How does he feel about a third of the angels rebelling? God and his view of rebellion it's got to be an integral part of our mind to understand what a danger that thing is. And then we're going to talk about how God's design flourishes under something that's called self-government. It's amazing. You wouldn't even believe it was possible if it wasn't already obvious that there is this God who wants to put forth authoritative laws for man to live by and yet back off and say, but I expect you to self Govern. I expect you to govern yourself first. He doesn't want to be there like our government wants to do. And that is to get so controlling so they can put cameras everywhere, so they can have access to your bank accounts, so they can digitize money, so that they can even tell you, hey, you got $10, you can't spend it on, um, you know, animal products, but you could spend it on vegetables. This is where the world's going. A government who acts like God doesn't even act. And that is God says, here, do it this way. He backs off and lets you self-govern. And then he visits you from time to time to bring you, you know, to account for what you're doing. This is God's design. This is the only way it works. It would never work the way the government is trying to take us. Never. It's going to be a tyranny. It's going to be inhuman to live like that. It's going to be inhuman that, you know, that you drive down the road and you go five miles over the speed limit and then you get a ticket in the mail because there's 59 cameras on the streets. We know how this works. It's not according to the way we were made. God made us to self-govern. He's going to put forth the rules. He's, they're going to be just. They're going to be uh, best for everybody. And then he's going to back off and disappear and see if you do it. That is the whole way that that works. And so we're also going to talk about and explain how being under authority at all times creates the greatest freedom to live by. In other words, the most free human being in the world is the one who gives a bear hug to the whole idea of authority and subjugation, knowing when they're in charge that they're not just the last of the authority, that it's God over them that is an authority and they have to answer to him on how they use authority. This is freeing because then you're careful with what you do. You're careful with what you say, just like I am at work. At work, I ask myself many times, should I do this or should I do that? Then I, the next question I have is, do I have the authority to do this? 
If I know I don't have the authority to make that decision, it's somebody else's decision and I don't need to lose sleep over it. Even though it cogs, it, it clogs up the process and I could get more done if they would just let me make all the decisions. That's how I think. But nevertheless, it doesn't work that way. In my job, I, I work at a prestigious company and there's, there's I think, 11 stories downtown uh, San Jose and Silicon Valley. And I went in there and they had, they put me in a place uh, and I was far from the printer. I was like, man, I don't want to walk five minutes to go get my printouts every day. And so the difference in me and everybody else is they all just said, well, I'm paid by the hour. I'm going to walk over there and get the printouts. And I'm like, no, I'm going to go buy me a printer and put it on my desk. And I'll pay for the ink and I'll have the printer right there. And guess what? I can just sit down and print all I want. I don't have to do all this silly stuff of walking back and forth. Almost nobody did that. I would say out of, out of 200 people there, I only seen two or three people who literally had the mentality to be independent and get their own printer for $79 from HP. So... This is how I think. But you can't do everything at work that way because you will step on other people's toes who have authority over you. And therefore, you can't just say, hmm, I'll just do that. I get emails all the time. I could answer the question, but I'm not authorized to answer the question. And so I sit there and I go, well, that's terrible. This person who makes $800 an hour is going to have to take the time to answer this email. And I, you know, I could answer it right now quickly and they could get on with this job. But I have to ask myself again, do I have the authority to make that decision? I know the decision they're going to make. I know exactly what the answer is, but I don't have the authority to answer that question. So the only thing I can do is shoot the email to the boss and say, hey, I can answer this question like this. If you want me to, let me know. And they'll say, oh, thank you. Yes, do it. But you do that three or four times and pretty soon you can get in trouble because you can think, oh, they're just going to say that again. And then pretty soon you're assuming authority you don't have. Authority never goes away and it never will. If you want to serve God, you have to embrace authority. So we want to make sure that we understand that human beings are being have been created in such a way that you cannot possibly live unless you're under authority. All of you guys that are young and still at home, imagine when you were three, four, five, six years old, if mom and dad said, no, we're not your boss, you're your boss. You eat what you want, you come and go when you want, you come home when you want, go out with whoever you want. How long would you be alive? You wouldn't be here today. You'd have been run over by a car because someone needed who had authority needed to keep you out of the street, needed to make sure no one took advantage of you. So what changed? You're a little older now. You don't think you need it? That's what my message is. You need it if you're 64 like I am. You still need authority. You cannot go, I'm older now. I know what to do. No, you still have to find your place where are you? What is your responsibility? And I'm talking here about Christianity. I'm talking about what God has laid forth in the Bible. I'm talking about how to maximize the freedom God wants you to have as a human being. And then we are going to actually go all the way back to Adam and Eve and look at their choice to rebel and God's choice to let them have the opportunity to rebel. Have you ever asked God, why did you let me do this? You ever get in an accident and say, why didn't you make me stay in bed today? Oh, <laughs> why didn't you keep me from getting sick? Why didn't you keep me from getting hit by that car? There's a lot of things that we would like God to do, but he doesn't do them because he has put us into a situation where he wants us to learn how to operate under authority and make good decisions. These things are illustrated in the story of Adam and Eve when we get to it that I can't wait to share with you. We're also going to look at Jesus, who is, of course, God in the flesh. So he's our highest example of, think about this, God is the highest example of humility and submission even to 
those who are ungodly and unfair with governmental power stacked against them. We're going to look at that illustration and we're going to see that Jesus, with all the power in the world, let them kill him. And the Bible literally says, and he could have called legions of angels to destroy the world and set himself free. Would we do that when we had the power to stop it? Well, I don't think we have to really ask ourselves that question because even this week we didn't do that when it wasn't even a big deal. We didn't, we weren't going to die. But we still didn't say, God, not my will, your will. We still couldn't not say the retort we wanted to say. We still couldn't keep the temper under control. Why is it? Because a lack of understanding. A lack of understanding about the quality and the freedom that comes from giving God everything. Like that song says, I want to pour myself out before you. I want to give you all the rights to my life because you're worthy. You're God. You aren't going to lead me astray. You're going to help me. Such an important uh, factor here. We're also going to demonstrate that it is very important to understand the process of submission to authority doesn't change in, in, in any time in the future. It never will. Kids at home can say, someday I'm going to get a mom out of mom and dad's house and I'm not going to have these dumb rules. No, you're going to have a whole new set of rules. And if you violate those rules wrongly, you'll find yourself in trouble with the law, the real law, the ones where they carry guns. And there again, if you handle that wrong, then you'll just get sunken deeper and deeper in trouble with authority because the real problem is rebellion of the heart, not taking that place of subjugation as a, the will of God. This is the will of God. If I'm at home and my parents, I still live with my parents, it is the will of God that I honor my parents so that I will have a long life, a blessed life on the earth. That's the will of God. If I know that going in, then when my parents say, no, you can't go out Friday, we got church. Or no, you can't do this on the weekend uh, for this reason. Then you don't hate them. You don't despise them because they're making rules. Most parents who love kid, their kids don't just make rules for fun of it. There are good reason for the rules. And that's why we're blessed to come to church and have somebody say these things because what I'm doing, you guys, is supporting your role as parents for your kids so they can hear it and they can get the understanding, but also so we and you can hear it so that you can have understanding with God and what he's doing in your life because we're all doing the same thing. The kids are, are like sick of being under control and then sometimes we're sick of being under God's control. We can't let ourselves be that way. That's, that's a bad attitude. And that, that's suicide in the long run. It's not possible that that could ever be good for us. So it's going to be very important for us to realize in any world that God's ever going to be a part of, authority and submission is always going to be the deal. But when you, are, when you have embraced submission, then it isn't a deal anymore. You just know your role. If you're a cop, you walk out, you tell everybody what to do, you go to the cop station where your boss is, and you go where he tells you to go patrol today because he's in charge of you. You don't blow your whistle and pull your gun in front of your boss. Is that a hard thing? No, it's simple. It makes sense. It works really nice. And with God, we don't pull rebellion on God, and we don't pull rebellion on on those God has placed over us. This is so important to understand. So we're going to talk about purposely placing yourself under authority and finding the transformative feeling and release of freedom that it brings you when you do it because it is God's wisdom and genius because he knew we would self-destruct without it. We're also going to explore the difference in challenging authority versus simply breaking rules like the rules of government. There is a big difference, and we even have an example of that from Satan himself. In the Bible, there are, there are times when Satan just breaks rules. There are times when he 
resist God's authority. And the two always come together eventually because the rule breaker eventually wants to stick it to the, th the authority. And that is exactly what our human nature does. And then we will also introduce a principle called the principle of Satan. And I want to do that because the principle of Satan needs to be known so that you never operate on that principle because that will associate you with Satan and that will bring about your own destruction. The principle of Satan is a very important thing to, to get to know what it is. And we're going to look again at Jesus, our highest example in all these things, and watch how he used humility when he was in the world and he always actually made sure that he didn't act or do anything that he wasn't first instructed to do by God. That's exactly the picture of being under authority that we need. And then last of all, we're going to wrap up this, this lesson series on the three gray shades of gray that look like submission because you're doing some of what the authority wants you to do. But in the end, it's not submission at all because what you do is you're choosing to do one thing, but you're saying, no, I'll just rebel on this other thing. And therefore, it's shades of gray, which isn't strictly bring yourself in submission to authority. So these are the things that we're going to cover. Now, let's get to uh, the next slide. And you've seen this slide in the last couple of weeks. We're only going to focus on authority and subjugation or subordination again tonight. And so let's go to the next slide. And this is where we left off last week. The umbrellas represent layers of authority. So you have God as the highest. You have, and by the way, even, even atheistic world leaders are under that authority. There is no authority in the world outside of God. And if you read the book of Daniel, one of the first stories you'll find in the book of Daniel is a leader who didn't even know God's name, didn't know who God was, but in short order, he found out God was in complete control of every kingdom in the world, including his, and God demonstrates that to Nebuchadnezzar. Then there's delegated authority, and that means any authority that's not God is delegated, and that means that God has dished it out. He has said this authority is good, it's real, and we should go with it. And then we have delegated subordination. This is an interesting one, and, and I've never heard anybody teach on authority and actually use these words, but to me, it's, it's like axiomatic that if you're going to embrace authority, you also have to embrace the idea that there's got to be some people who are under authority, and they are not always necessarily the ones who chose to be under authority. Like, I didn't choose to be under Biden's authority. I would never do that. I'm, I'm more sane than that. But he is the president. I am under his authority, and I do have to continue to do the United States r rules and obey them because that authority is real. Even if his brain's not, that authority is real, and I've got to uh, pay attention to it. So delegated uh, authority and then delegated subordination, and then there's also illegitimate authority. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but it's really easy to understand that when the government, who is a legitimate authority, tells the church, like in the book of Acts, do not preach anymore in the name of Jesus, they said to their authorities who told them that, you judge whether we are to listen to you or to God. So what they did is they said, doing this, making this rule is an illegitimate use of authority and we have a higher authority to listen to, and therefore, we know that one's illegitimate. And so that's what that's about. Now, we, we covered these first two scriptures uh, last week, but I want to cover them again as the basis of going forward. Romans 13, 1, 2, and 5. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. 
Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So this is really my whole message right here. One must be in subjection. And so my, my message for tonight, you got to ask yourself, does it bother you to accept all the layers of subjection that you have been appointed by your particular place in the world? And if it bothers you, then you know what you need to work on. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Doesn't mean that you don't love Jesus. It means that God has a big job. And that big job is to either encourage you to crush your own stubbornness of heart and rebellion or to wait until God has to do it. It's always easier if we do it on our own will and purpose and subject ourselves by taking ourselves under our own self-control. That's what God ideally wants. But it says if we won't, it says that he will then discipline us and we will have many heartaches as a result of not paying close attention to these issues. So this here in Romans 13 is clearly about the subject of authority of all kinds. And it says that those that exist have been instituted, put in place by God. I promise you our world and your world, your house, your family cannot exist in peace and freedom unless this is embraced as a principle that is something you can't live without. So what we're, what, as you probably can tell, what I'm trying to do is win your attitude adjustment, is win you over to God's side about this subject so that you realize it's not against you. It's actually made for the way you are. It is that without bringing these two things together in proper order, that your life is nothing but going to be nothing but a, a, a mishap, a wreck. It's going to fall apart. It's going to explode. And so you don't want that. God doesn't desire that for you. First Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So amazing. Honor everyone. Honor everyone. This would really shut us down in our talk about other people if we really believe that it was our job to honor everyone. And imagine the trouble our mouths get us into in the spirit realm when we find ourselves saying things without thinking and that evil spirits who you can't tell are around are listening for ways to make sure that they can undo your life. And they look for your weaknesses and they see that you're handling the things of God as if they don't apply to you. This is where we fail. This is where we fall. This is why some of the more lurid and sensual temptations are hard to get past because we're not paying attention to these deeper things that matter more and have much more ramifications in the long run. Now, let's go on to the, the next two scriptures, John 19, 10 and 11. And I want to show you our Lord and Savior demonstrating what I'm teaching that we should have the attitude of. Look at this. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to hold on? You? Hold on. So Jesus was refusing to answer his question. And so this is the context. So Pilate's looking at him and he's saying, you, you're not going to answer my question? Go ahead. So Pilate said to him, will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who has delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Pilate doesn't know it, but he's talking to the God who created the world he would have been completely devastated if he would have knew that information. 
The Bible says in another place that they would not have crucified the Lord of glory if they knew what that meant and who he was. That's the truth about Pilate. Jesus is standing there with all the authority that exists. And he simply says to Pilate, without fear, that he corrected him. You're, you're wrong. You, you don't have any authority over me. You think that, but you're wrong. Now, I want to give you the proof of that. Pilate's wife had a dream. And that dream, in the dream, she was warned about Jesus and killing him. And she went to her husband and said, have nothing to do with this innocent man. So Pilate purposely decided to listen to his wife, wise man. And he got there with a determination he was going to let Jesus go. If you read the accounts, it's very clear. He just wants a little credit here. He's going to let him go. So he's saying, hey, you, don't you know I can let you go? He wanted him to say, yeah, please, Pilate, let me go. But Jesus told him something that he didn't even know. You don't have the power to let me go or to hold me. And in the end, the people, uh, the crowd, started screaming at Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. And they saw him deliberating, and they said, if you don't crucify him, you're no friend of Caesar. Well, that got his attention. Now he was being pitted as an enemy of Caesar, which was his boss, the king in Rome. And so Pilate washed his hands in front of all the people saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. That tells us he had no intention of crucifying Jesus. But he did it anyway, which proved the humility of Jesus' reply. I can't promise to pay you a bunch of money if you'll let me go because you don't even have the power to do it. It's basically what Jesus is saying. Now let's go to another one in Acts 23, 1 through 5. And here we're going to look at how Paul handles his own perceived arrogance in ignorance in this situation, watch what it ha happens here. And looking intently out at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. This is perfect. This is where we need to live in marriage. We need to live at work. We need to live in this particular place. Paul knew more about the law than the guys who were priests in front of him. Paul was a... He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was taught by the most knowledgeable rabbi in Israel at the time, Gamaliel. Uh, he was mad because they hit him, which was contrary to the law, and he knew it. So in other words, they broke God's law because they were angry, and they lashed out and not being themselves under the authority of God's law the way they sub were supposed to be, Paul points it out, and he's angry about it because he didn't think they would do that, being that they were in charge of God's law. And then they reminded him, oh, the guy that you're in front of is now the high priest, and Paul, disregarding how he felt, and this is the key, you, you can't live your life with regards to authority, by how you feel about them. You live your life by how God has set it all up. And if they're your authority, it doesn't matter if you like them or you love them, or if they're fair or they're not fair. So Paul immediately brings himself into subjugation to God's law. And he said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So he just called them a whitewashed wall. In other words, there's a dirty wall and someone went and got some white paint. They didn't clean the, <laughs> they didn't clean the dirt off the wall. They painted it white. And he's telling the high priest, 
You are so dirty underneath that white veneer washed wall. You stink. And then it's like, oh, wait, he's the high priest. And Paul immediately backs off. That is what God wants us to get to. He's not asking you to always feel like it, to always feel like obedience, to always feel like being subject and submissive. He's asking you for the sake of your conscience and for the sake of God to always do it, no matter how you feel about it, because there's this amazing transformation that takes place as a result when we do these things. That's why I tell you that being raised in the church I was raised in, the organization I was raised in, that all the emphasis of the power of God was put on things that had no, no actual power that ever saved me from anything. It, it felt good. It looked crazy, <laughs> to be honest, but it, um, it didn't have the power to save me when I went out to the real world and I seen what was going on. I used to preach to my church about women in hair because, as you know, in the, in the organization, that, that cutting your hair if, uh, if you're a woman is like becoming Judas to them. They wouldn't cut their hair one inch if it saved uh, the world because there's a rule and you can't have anything but uncut hair, which is not a biblical thing, but it's, they think it is. And I used to note that being raised in that realm of this strict law of not cutting your hair, and by the way, I'm all for long hair on women. I appreciate that my wife wears long hair. She doesn't have to. I don't force her to. But she knows I prefer it. She knows I think it's biblical. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's uncut hair. As a matter of fact, I like it when she trims it a little bit and it looks nice and kept. But what... What I'm saying here is, is that uh, I noticed as a young pastor coming up and, and when I became a pastor and I had to start defending these rules that were all around and I realized, wait a minute, almost every woman I know as I've been raised in this group, they're all uh, rebellious. They're all the ones in charge of their household. Their husbands walk around like little henpeck guys that couldn't make a decision if their life depended on it. And I realized that what happened there is they put this, this rule of hair above the actual reason for it. And here's the reason. The reason is if you wear your hair as a covering, the way God meant hair to be for women, it's a covering. And that is a sign on your head that says, when you see me, this hair means I embrace my authority. I want you to know I'm sending a signal to humans and to devils that I am not one who wants to be outside of the, the control of my authority. And so if you are a woman and you wore your hair to show that because from your heart you wanted everybody to know, I do this for this purpose even if you wore like the apostolics do, they, they wear actual veils to cover their heads. Um, and they do it for the same purposes. Even if you embrace those things, which is okay to embrace, by the way. I'm not against anyone using their hair as, as a sign. But let's make sure it's a sign that's not saying, I'm an angel, but really inside I'm a devil. I'm trying to cover this up. And you're just trying to fool everybody. I'm submitted to God in this ridiculous, boy, I can't even trim the dead ends off my hair. That's, that's how they feel about it. They feel like you're a complete hypocrite and you're going to split hell wide open if you cut an inch off your hair. And when I was battling this in the 80s and I was like seeing all these things and realizing this is just hogwash. This is... This is overemphasis of things that don't matter so that we don't have to deal with the things that do matter. If I'm going to have anybody, a man or a woman, come and tell me that God cares about the length of hair, 
I first want to examine their life and see if they feel just as strongly about God having honor by their subjugation to all authority, the, 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 the whole spectrum. Because if they don't appreciate authority from the cop on the street to the manager that owns the restaurant to wherever you are, if, if you're not looking at people like, oh, okay, they, they rule here. They make the rules. This, this is... I'm not going to rebel against this group. In other words, if you have that spectrum, then it all makes sense. I remember having a discussion when I first grew a beard and I I met with a lot of a lot of uh, angst over that from people because that, again, was something that was going to send me to hell. Um, Nevertheless, Jesus had a beard. What? And so (laughs) I'm like, wow, uh, okay. And I I would try to talk to folks like that. And and I told one lady, I said, you know what? I can go in the bathroom right now and I can shave my beard off. And in about 60 seconds, I can be completely compliant with the rule not to have facial hair. But you got rebellion in your heart and you've had it in your heart against your husband the whole time you've been married. And I promise you, you can't go in the bathroom and turn around, make a prayer and come out and never rebel again. I said, so... What's worse, facial hair, women not cutting their hair, or is the real issue the real issue? The real issue is always the real issue, and the other stuff doesn't matter. I don't care if a woman has, you know, two inches of hair. If she has embraced authority, she's godly. I don't recommend it, especially today when you can be confused with the other bunch of crazies running around trying to be men when they're women and so forth, I think we need to look and embrace our gender that we were born with as glory to God. And we need to dress like that. We need to look like that. But having been raised how I was in the situation I was, I happen to know none of that matters unless you get down to these nitty gritty issues that really make a difference. I'm basically out of time, so we're gonna stop here. But if Mike would go to the next slide, next week we're gonna start with this story. And I'll tell you what I like to do is give you homework. It's easy, just read this chapter this week, 1 Samuel 15. Because I'm not gonna read it, reading a whole chapter takes too long. Uh, I'm gonna tell you the story, but I'd like you to read it so that as I tell the story, you, you have the details already in your mind. And I'm going to show you the quintessential story in the Bible that deals with authority, how it works, how God views it, and how one man, King Saul, completely ruined his life over a simple decision not to ask himself that question, do I have the authority to do this? And not only did he break God's law of what God told him to do, but then he decided he was king, he had authority, so he could actually act as priest. And for that one day, that one act, God forever forsook this man. Is the message, watch out, God's going to forsake you? No, that's not the message at all. That's not the threat. All this is for us is we live in a time of grace. God doesn't even do things like he did in the Old Testament. These were done to give us the life illustrations of what, what he really feels about sin and what he really sees when we do these kind of things. But he has saved us. And because he has saved us, he has forgiven us of all of our sins, all of our future sin, and all of our inclinations to rebellion. And I want that to be the thing we close with tonight and, and, and emphasize. Because when we look at these Old Testament examples, we could come away with like the feeling of, you know, I'm hopeless because I keep falling in the wrong places. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're not only not ever hopeless, 
but you're getting, you're on the verge of transformation as you subject yourself to the understanding that I'm trying to share with you from the scriptures to win you over, not to beat you over the head, not to, to give you rules you don't feel like you can keep, but to give you understanding which promotes the keeping of the rules. There's a big difference. God does not threaten annihilation if you mess up this week or you mess up for a year. That's not how it works. But he's constantly trying to get you in where you can be blessed, where you can be set free. You, as a matter of fact, you have no idea the angelic being that you can be if you would give yourself to the Holy Spirit and quit living according to the flesh. If, you know, I like milk. I can't drink it hardly anymore but uh, because I'm diabetic, but I love milk. I could drink a gallon a day if someone would let me. I like it that much. But then I would be the size of a barn. But milk is so good unless you leave it out overnight. And if you leave it out overnight in the elements and let it do what nature does, it will be spoiled, it will stink, it'll just be awful, right? Same with almost any food. This is what our nature is. Our nature has been left out of the refrigerator too long. And we need, we need to understand that if we can get it forgiven and washed away through forgiveness and start over again tomorrow and start putting the milk in the refrigerator instead of leaving it out again for a night, that we can have this source of wonderful input through the Word of God that will transform us to such a degree that you wouldn't even recognize yourself. And I say this because... I experienced this in my own life, in my own marriage. Me and my wife are not the two kids that got married in 1978 in Phoenix, Arizona. We have been completely changed by the Word of God to completely different people. Do we ever revert? Sure. Do we ever have a throwback moment? Yes. But you know what we do? We, self, we self-correct, or the Holy Spirit corrects us. And we realize that street's a dead end. We want to stay on the highway. We constantly are getting better with one another. We are constantly finding the right place to be in our roles. We are constantly finding the right way to show love instead of hate. Does it come natural? Absolutely not. We have to read books, listen to YouTubes, read the Bible. Talk to other people. Be around other people. It takes all these things to change us. And we're being changed day by day by these things. And so that's why I know I'm doing a good job if I can get you to come here and listen to these things because it will expose you to what you're not going to get anywhere else. And you know what that's going to do? It's going to make you have a strong marriage someday. It's going to make you have things cohesive and free and peaceful and loving someday if you keep approaching it with the idea of faith. God's going to help me get there. And I'm not going to get there next week. I'm not going to get there next year. But my goodness, the things, the progress that can be made and the new person that you can be as a result of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 6, 8 Galatians 6, 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from his own flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from that same Spirit reap eternal life. Look how simple it is. How do you spoil the milk? Leave it on the counter all overnight. How do you spoil? How do you spoil from your flesh? How do you reap corruption in the flesh? Do what it wants. How do you get away from that and have life eternal bubbling out of your life follow the spirit what's the spirit jesus said the words that i speak to you they're spirit and they're life this is the spirit don't make it a mystical thing it is mystical it's just as mystical mystical as it is concrete when you open the bible they're both real just like your body is physical but you are also spiritual 
sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. That's what moves you apart from your loved ones. That's what moves you apart and gives you that long face and makes you look like you're miserable. You're sowing to the flesh. But if you sow to the spirit, forgive, love, believe all things, hope all things, then you are sowing to the spirit. The spirit of God, Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. They will give you life. Lord, thank you for our time together tonight. I pray that the, the word of God will be effective in all of our lives because we've heard it, we've applied it, and we've uh, sorted through it, Lord God, to understand how it's practically able to help us. We pray, Lord, that you will encourage us with it and help us to feel like we can be conquerors and overcome. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us on our Fathom Ministries podcast. If this ministry has been beneficial to you in your walk with the Lord, please consider a monthly donation to our ministry effort by clicking on the donate button in the description of this video or podcast. To find out more about Fathom Ministries Church, please join us at fathomministrieschurch.com. Thank you for listening and supporting this ministry.